We are in a series on our spiritual disciplines. Uh, Today we are dealing with the discipline of humility. We've seen the importance of the Bible and uh, not only biblical information, but its application in our life. We've seen the importance of having honest and uh, transparent communion uh, conversations with the Lord where we deal honestly with ourselves, but also in prayer, uh, communicating with him about exactly what's going on, and we talked about that. Today we talk about uh, thinking right about ourselves, humility. Next week we'll deal with self-control. Uh, then I have a good friend, Nathan uh, Killian, that's coming to fill in for me on uh, Sunday the 13th because I will uh, be in a walker, and I probably don't need to be trying to move around up here. Um, I might be here sitting in the back next to Dale, but uh, in the expensive seats, but um, I know. Uh, so anyway, and then after that, I, I want to deal with this whole idea of investing wisely, uh, which is the sacrifice. I want to let alert you, um, back when we were doing our series on uh, the Bible from 30,000 feet, I allowed you to ask questions, and I had such a good response from so many people. Um, I was even suggested, why don't we do a whole Sunday of just question and answers? I say, because we'd be here till 3 o'clock. Um, I'm going to do that the last Sunday of August, okay? And, and I'm going to ask you to do something for me so it's just not a free-for-all. Um, I'm going to ask you, and I'll put it in the bulletins uh, the next couple of weeks, a little slip of paper where you can ask your questions and put it in a little jar in the back uh, so I can kind of organize it a little bit, sort of, okay? Uh, just so we can answer a few questions, kind of get the pump primed, and then we'll, then we'll go crazy with it, okay? Last Sunday of, 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 uh, of August, okay. Discipline. Somebody, something, discipline is something everybody wants, everybody admires. It's something that some people exhibit remarkably, and yet it is so hard to come by. Discipline defined is the hard work done in obscurity for the sake of excellence. I've noticed that the disciplined people are almost always humble people. They don't need the cheering crowds or to feed their hunger for excellence. Discipline is in the birthing room of great musicians. Jaska Heifetz the greatest violiner, violinist maybe of all time, but certainly of the 20th century, first pick up his violin when he was three years of age. He practiced four hours a day, every day, his entire life, to the point when he died at 87. Now, if you do the math, you'll find out that he spent more than 100,000 hours of practice in private, punctuated by an occasional one-hour performance in public. The great Italian painter and Renaissance mathematician Leonardo da Vinci desired nothing less than anatomical perfection in his paintings. He spent hours studying the human body, He was commissioned once to paint a portrait, and he became so frustrated with his inability to paint the body that he wished that he ended up spending hours, thousands of hours, just painting hands until he felt it was just right. Centuries later, we gaze at his paintings with awe. And we forget the hours of preparation. 
We don't even know of the diligent training that da Vinci put forth when he sculpted hands. And yet we are the ones that enjoy the magnificent art. Michael Singletary was barely six feet tall and a little little over 200 pounds when he first came into the NFL as a middle linebacker. He was, ended up becoming one of Chicago Bears' most imposing middle linebackers, ending up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He broke tackling records almost as much as he broke helmets. Singletary was precise. He always knew where the ball was going. And all of that came from the discipline of intense preparation, physically and mentally, hours and hours before the rest of the team arrived and hours after the team had left. He would spend watching film of the opposing team, training tirelessly in the weight room, all for less than 60 minutes on the playing field, fewer than 20 times a year. We love great music. We admire magnificent art. We we envy the coordination and skill of, of superb athletes. But how easy it is us for us to forget the discipline that we do not see that made the gifted musicians, the creative artists, and the superb athletes being able to be able to function at their best so that their work was worthy of our admiration and respect. What's true of musical artists, athletes, is even more true among the godly. If you know someone who is truly an individual that you respect because of their spirituality, you can be certain that they've cultivated the discipline of godliness. They weren't born that way. The life that you respect, the hope you, that you could emulate someday didn't automatically come with age or promotion or position. They paid dearly for their spiritual depth. Hours of trying and failing and trying again suffering through hardship, learning to rely on God, yielding themselves and disciplining themselves to the spiritual disciplines that we're talking about, they they found a way for that to work its way out because they understood Paul's words to Timothy when he said, train yourself for godliness. Godliness has one very important difference when <clears throat> compared with musical art or, or athletics or any other venture. Godliness has no public performance in mind. That's especially true with the discipline of humility. Humility. For humility forbids self-congratulations or public applause. If anyone else notices, it's incidental. We pursue spiritual disciplines for the audience of one. Paul gives us our goal as God's children. For my determined purpose is that I may know him that I may be progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness even to his death. Our focus is the discipline of humility 
And I think we need to begin by clarifying four important issues. Just so we're all on the same page. First of all, humility is not merely a virtue, it is a discipline. It is a virtue. What's more true is it's, it's a discipline. Although humility is a Christ-like virtue, it is best under, it is being neither, excuse me, it's been neither understood or admired in most cultures. Boy, my tongue is not working this morning. Look at the models of strong leadership in our culture. Consider how strange it is in our world for a strong leader to be humble. Bending the knee to help others or to admit weakness, or to make yourself vulnerable to those who would take your place. (laughs) Leaders usually view themselves as being there to be served, except for maybe short periods of time when it's noble to serve others, but not for too long. Not so in the culture of Christ. Humility is not something we merely have. It is something we are called to do. Secondly, we appreciate humility in others, but we rarely want it for ourselves. The reason that is true is because it's a, it has such a high price. Humility is not what gets us ahead in this world. And if we're completely honest... We do like having humble people around us because they don't threaten our position. They're safe people. They don't mind standing on the sidelines rather than scramble for the top of the hill. Even the Lord's disciples weren't immune. I love Jesus' response. The disciples of Jesus came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing along the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they were arguing to one another about who was the greatest. He sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. You see, if we see humility as a discipline, not merely a virtue, we'll better understand what our purpose in life is and the tasks that are before us. Thirdly, humility is not the result of low self-esteem. There are some within Christianity who have the would have us focus only on our unworthiness, our depravity, our worthlessness, justifying that mindset by pointing to the reality that we're nothing apart from Jesus Christ. And although that is true, that mindset doesn't nurture humility. That is not how Jesus came by his. When he was on the earth, Jesus had no sense of inferiority. He never struggled with insecurity. I mean, how could he? He was God. Philip Yancey co-authored with Dr. Paul Brand some of the most compelling books I think I've ever read. Faithfully and, uh, fearfully and Wonderfully Made is one book uh, that they wrote. Another one was The Gift of Pain. The late Dr. Paul Brand was one of the 20th century's most respected physicians. He did most of his work in India among those who had leprosy. He loved India's least of these. 
And in his ministry to them, his service to them, he discovered for centuries what was overlooked about that disease. Although he was a brilliant physician and medical teacher, writer, speaker, he was a champion of the discarded. Here's what Yancey had to say about him. Meeting Dr. Brand, I realized that I had misconstrued humility as a negative self-image. Paul Brand obviously knew his gifts. He had finished first throughout his academic career and had attended, uh, attended many award banquets honoring his accomplishments. Yet he recognized his gifts as just that, gifts from a loving creator and used them in Christ-like ways of service. When I first met him, Brand was still adjusting to life in the United States. Everyday uh, luxuries made him nervous, and he longed for a simple life close to the soil. He knew presidents, kings, and celebrities, yet he rarely mentioned them. He talked openly about his failures and always tried to deflect credit for his successes to his associates. Most impressive to me, the wisest and most brilliant man I've ever met devoted much of his life to some of the lowliest people on the planet, members of the untouchable caste of India, those afflicted with leprosy. Humility has nothing to do with your self-image. Matter of fact, humility has everything to do, to do with your strength and inner security. Genuinely humble people, those who have a desire to seek the well-being of others, are usually very secure people. Fully aware of their gifts, their training, their experience, and all those other attributes that make them successful. But that security, that honest, healthy self-assessment relate, actually cause them to be have a humble mindset that translated into actions that were obscured. Interestingly, the elder President Bush, Bush one, I guess, <clears throat> praised Ronald Reagan for his humility when he eulogized President Reagan at President Reagan at his funeral. In 1981, if you remember, if you were alive back then, uh, President Reagan was recovering from a gunshot wound he received during an assassination attempt. Just days after the surgery that repaired his life-threatening injuries, his aides discovered President Reagan on his hands and knees in his hospital room wiping up the water on the floor that he had spilled. Bush said of Reagan, he worried that his nurse would get in trouble from her, his, her superiors for the mess that he himself had made. That gracious act of humility demonstrated the strength of President Reagan's character. How rarely would we imagine a president on his hands and knees cleaning up his own mess? That's not merely a virtue of a great person, but it's the action, the discipline of great character. Fourthly, as a discipline, we can measure our success in humility. As a virtue, we cannot. As soon as we think we're humble, <laughs> we're not. And you find that the genuinely humble person, they have a natural self-forgetfulness. They don't think of themselves as being humble because they rarely think of themselves. Humble people are too occupied with the well-being of other people to, go, to be concerned about their own interest. Steve Wilkins, in his authored a book called Call of Duty, The Sterling Nobility of General Robert E. Lee. In that work, we find these words. The degree to which General Lee was indifferent to his own honor is astonishing. 
After the war, Lee often received distinguished visitors from the north into his home in Lexington. Assuming that the Lees, like many prominent families in the north, had household servants, the guests, after retiring to bed, would often leave their boots and shoes outside their bedroom doors to be cleaned and blackened. Many a night, it was the general who stayed up after all others had retired, and in order not to embarrass his guests, he collected their boots and cleaned and polished them himself. That's the discipline of humility. Have I convinced you yet? To pursue humility as an action, a behavior, not a quality of your character. Yet if we exercise this discipline long enough, it'll dominate our character. But the transformation of our character won't happen automatically or easily or quickly. What does the exercise of this discipline look like? I think the Bible gives us three examples. Each one illustrates a key principle. Firstly, humility starts at the bottom. I wish being around humble people would automatically cause it to rub off on me. It doesn't. In Mark chapter 10, there's an incident involving James and John, two brothers. Situation that will make most parents smile because if you have kids, you face the same situation. By the way, John is the one who wrote the gospel as well as the revelation in three other letters. John is looking out for John in Mark 10. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. <laughs> that sound like one of your kids? He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. Jesus said to him, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it has been prepared. And then the, when the ten heard of it, they began to be indignant with James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Sounds like a couple kids with their dad, doesn't it? Dad, we want you to do us a favor. We want you to say yes. We want you to do whatever we ask, okay? Promise? And don't miss what they wanted. See, they had hoped that Jesus would eventually defeat the Romans and then he would be count, crowned king of Israel and he would put them in peak, key positions of power. You see, in the royal court, there would be a chair to the right of the king, there would be a chair to the left of the king. They didn't want to move Jesus from his rightful place, of course. 
but they had no desire to serve anyone else. Most of us can identify with that kind of ambition. Hey, we're happy to follow and obey Jesus. But we loathe (laughs) submitting to a fellow human being. It's hard enough to submit to the Lord Jesus, who is perfect. But giving up our comfort or position or privilege... For the sake of another sinner, ah, that's a little bit more difficult. I find it interesting that Jesus doesn't rebuke them for their lust for power. But I love his response to their request. It's a classic way of cutting to the chase. He responds, you got no clue what you're asking. Seats next to Jesus in the kingdom aren't filled on first-come, first-served basis. Certainly, the most ambitious don't get the nod. In God's evaluation, suffering brings reward. And positions of authority come at the expense of selfless sacrifice. The cup was in, it was a Jewish metaphor that could refer to either joy or judgment for sin. Baptism was a common word picture in the Old Testament literature for someone who was overwhelmed by tragedy or sorrow. Jesus here is referring to his own suffering and humiliating death. And he invited James and John to join him in that destiny. Does that invitation sound familiar? For my determined purpose is that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. But the disciples didn't get it. So when he asked them, are you able to do this? Their reply demonstrates their ignorance. Sure. Yeah, we're able. Probably thinking that he was asking them to fight by his side to take the throne of Israel. And of course, the response of the other ten disciples is predictable. They're enraged, outraged, ticked off, whatever phrase you want to use. But why are they so angry? They're angry at the audacity of James and John for being so bold about their ambition. I mean, they had taken the direct route for what they secretly wanted themselves. And Jesus takes the opportunity to do a little bit of mentoring. He uses the occasion to contrast kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world and and his kingdom. In the world's culture of the first century and of the 21st century, leadership is defined by high-ranking position, exercising of authority and power, dominion over people. The phrase exercise authority in Mark usually refers to forced forced subduing of one person by someone who is more powerful. It's not just someone taking charge. It's aggressive domination. Our world is run by chain of command. In the corporate world, you have a CEO, you have executive vice presidents, you have vice presidents, managers, superintendents. In the military, you've got generals 
commanding colonels, who command majors, who command captains, all the way down to the lowly private at the end of the mop handle. Those of you who have served in the military know the first lesson when you get to boot camp is your sergeant outranks you. And from 0300 till well after the sun sets for 12 weeks, he never lets you forget your position. The protocol is simple. Do whatever he says to do or else. That's lording over as Jesus used it. That's the way the system works, and don't you dare forget it. But Jesus barely takes a breath after contrasting those two kingdoms, and he says, not so among you. And the not so part in the original Greek is put at the front for emphasis. Not so in my kingdom. There's no status, no privileged rank. The lowly don't pamper the privileged. It's quite the opposite in my kingdom. And once he gets their attention, he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give. His life is a ransom for many. To serve and to give. In other words, in my kingdom, godliness starts at the bottom. What was true then is true now. You want to be like Jesus? Find the least desired position, the task nobody else wants, the worst seat in the house, and make it yours. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways to build the foundation of selflessness with Jesus at the cornerstone. This world does not need more prima donnas, okay? The world longs to find servants, authentic, humble-hearted servants. Rudyard Kipting, in his favorite poet, poem, Mary's Son, writes this. If you stop to find out what your wages will be and how they will clothe and feed you, Willie, my son, don't you go to the sea, for the sea will never need you. If you ask for a reason for every command and argue with people about you, Willie, my son, Don't you go to the land, for the land will do better without you. If you stop to consider the work you have done and to boast what your labor is worth, dear, angels may come for you, Willie, my son, and you'll never be wanted on earth, dear. The conclusion in Mark chapter 10, all 12 fail to understand what Jesus said after everything they had seen and heard. They went right on without a glimpse of understanding this new way of thinking. Obviously, humility does not come from hanging out with humble people. And at the risk of being overbearing, let me urge you not to miss the point, verse 34 of Mark chapter 8. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his instrument of death, and follow me. Secondly, humility grows out of gratitude. Mark wrote the events that occurred in the lives of the disciples where they lacked humility 
Paul encourages the Philippians to answer Jesus' call to selflessness so they could enjoy unity. A quality that no church can enjoy without members who cons- consistently pursue the discipline of humility. The believers in the church of Philippi lacked humility of mind, habitual selflessness that comes from consistently putting others ahead of yourself. And in chapter 2, verses 3 through 18, form two segments of Paul's exhortation. First of all, a command, and then a perspective. The command for humility is in verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What's the difference? Humility. The discipline of humility. I think of at least four important results of counting others more significant than yourself. We remove selfishness as a motivation. Second, we become less conceited. Third, we start thinking of others more important than ourselves. And fourth, we deliberately and consistently attend to their needs. And then in verses 5 through 11, the apostle provides a perspective that should spark our feelings of gratitude. When we talk about humility, when we talk about putting aside our own interests, which is the essence of surrendering, Paul uses Jesus as our example worth emulating. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Stop there for a second. It's already yours. The mind is yours. The ability is yours. You don't need something new. You just have to activate what you already have. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in a human form, he humbled himself even more by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You have that ability. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ lives in you. <coughs> As a result... God has highly (coughs) exalted and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me go back to the previous verses, and I want you to notice the downward trend. Christ Jesus is God. He didn't clutch his God equality as something to be held on to. He emptied himself. Now, there's a whole lot of theological implications on what he'd empty himself of. Let me solve the problem. He emptied himself of his independent use of his divine attributes. He didn't empty himself of his godness or his essence, of his power, of his knowledge. None of his characteristics as God were were gone. He humbled himself so he didn't use any of those things without the Father's approval. He then took on the form of a slave 
in becoming a man. In becoming a man, he then humbled himself as a man to be mistreated by his creatures. He became obedient to death, the plan for salvation, even death on a cross. <coughs> From the glories of heaven to the worst kind of death man could envision. He humbled himself. And Paul reminds us that he does it voluntarily so that one day he lifts us up. What is it that prompts humility in you you and I? What do I need to think or to do that will allow me to think less of myself and more of others? It's not complicated. It's simply a full appreciation for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for me. Everything I have, everything I am, every good thing I enjoy would not be possible if it wasn't for him. And the more I understand the price he paid, the less room I have for pride. The more I comprehend how Jesus humbled himself to serve me, the more I'm able to put the needs of others as a higher priority than my own. It starts with my spouse. It extends to my children my grandchildren, my extended family, my coworkers, my neighbors, my community. A heart filled with gratitude cannot be anything but humble. When I remember the suffering Christ Jesus endured on my behalf, that every breath is a gift from God, purchased by his son's agony on the cross, how can I waste my time and my energy on self-interest? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, probably one of the most brilliant scholars in the 20th century, wrote this. I am told that I am to esteem others better than myself, and there's only one thing that can make me do that. And thank God it does make me do it, and that is this. When I read the Bible and I see the sinful nature that is in me, I see my failures and my shortcomings. But even then, there is a tendency to to defend myself. There is only one thing I know that crushes me to the ground and humiliates me to the dust, and that is to look at the Son of God and especially to contemplate the cross. And then he quotes Isaac Watts, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Nothing else, he writes, can do that. When I see that I am a sinner, that nothing but the Son of God on the cross can save me, I am humbled to the dust. It is only the cross that makes me feel that. Nothing but the cross can give us the spirit of humility. It is only the cross and in the cross that this happens. He's absolutely right. For the child of God, the motivation for humility comes as a result of reflecting on Jesus Christ who gave his very blood as the sacrificial payment on the cross for my sin. So it grows out of gratitude, but it's also an act of faith. The apostle Peter learned humility the hard way. And as an expert on the subject, he knew that humility is an exercise in trust. 
1 Peter 5, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Notice, clothe yourself. Put on the garment. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Let's take a few minutes to ponder what he wrote. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward others. This first expression is intriguing. The verb refers to an apron worn by slaves. (laughs) John chapter 13 comes to mind. Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And when he had poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with his, the towel that was wrapped around him. Why were their feet dirty? Because there was no slave that would have washed their feet when they first came in. And so Jesus became the slave. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter quotes Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 here. And he reminds us that the arrogant are at odds with God. How strange for a believer, a follower of Jesus to be at odds with him. And yet that's exactly where we position ourselves when we walk in arrogance and pride. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Actually, this would be better rendered. Let yourselves be humbled under his mighty hand. In the Old Testament, the phrase mighty hand of God is used most often with two symbols in mind. God's hand of discipline and God's hand of deliverance. Both are his mighty hand. And Peter's point here is to submit to his discipline so that you can ultimately receive his blessing. Remember what we learned? Suffering brings reward. And you just don't sit there in the suffering. You cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This is the one that, for me, it seems so out of place. But, but remember what he's really trying to address here. The core issue is the foundational problem with our lack of humility. That's why for us, so often, prayer is a last resort, rather than our first response. Because we're going to fix it ourselves. And we think our way is better than God's way. And the source of our anxiety is our self-interest. The worry that if we don't watch out for ourselves, no one else will. And every single couple couple in the last 25 years that my wife and I have counseled, what's the biggest problem? Both spouses are looking out for themselves. They're not serving each other. They're not. Humility is a matter of faith. The discipline of putting others ahead of self to value them more than self. And if we genuinely believe that he cares for us, then we never need to worry about serving our own interests. (sighs) 
How do we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand? That's where the discipline of prayer comes in. You cast your anxieties on him. We don't worry if evil is getting the upper hand. When we obey the Lord and we humble ourselves, why? Because he's the Lord of everything. At the proper time, don't miss that. Not my time, obviously not your time, but in his time, he will lift us up. We will be exalted. Let me close quickly with the postures of humility. We were in Mark 10. We went to Philippians chapter 2. Then we were in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me give you one word for each. The postures of humility are this. Number one, sit. Sit on promoting yourself. You don't have to protect you. If God is on your side and you're walking humbly with your God and you're seeking him and you're actively involved in the disciplines <coughs> of reading his word, communicating with him, <coughs> Satan doesn't want me to talk about this. God will take care of you. He'll make it happen. Sit on the temptation to promote yourself, to protect yourself, to provide for yourself. Trust God to do it at the right time, in the right way. Secondly, stand up for others. Be sensitive to their needs. Look for opportunities to serve... (coughs) <clears throat> Y'all are supposed to be praying for me when I'm doing this. <clears throat> Stand up for them. How can I become a servant? How can I serve them? Lord, who do you want me to minister to today? And then when he prompts you, do it. Well, I don't even know them. Who cares? God does. Respond. Thirdly, bow low before God. Accept his discipline. Don't resist. Acknowledge his deliverances. Understand his mighty hands at work. Pray. Go back to the discipline of prayer as an act of faith. Release your anxieties. Douglas Freeman, in his four-volume set on Robert E. Lee, shares a touching scene. After the war, General Lee is wrinkled and gray and stooped over. He's near death when a young mother comes to see him with her infant son cradled in in her arms. The dying general reaches out for the baby and she responds by placing the infant in his still strong arms. The great general looks deeply into the eyes of the infant, looks up at the mother, looks back at the infant, and looks up at the mother again and says, teach him that he must deny himself. The path of greatness in the hall of fame of faith in heaven is accomplished and those saints are there because they traveled through the valley of selflessness. Deny yourself. And Christ-like humility will emerge from within you. It's almost automatic It is what our world desperately needs and can't figure out.
because the Christian community is awash with self-interest. It's a discipline to simply take on the mantle of Jesus Christ and serve. To consider others' needs is more important than your own. And in the hardship of doing that, you simply humble yourself before God and allow his mighty hand to work. And you simply say, here I am, here I am, send me. If not us, who? If not now, when? Let's pray. Father, thank you again that you're at work in our midst. In the midst of this church, but in the midst of our own lives. create in us a heart that desires to seek your way, which is the way of renunciation, humility, gentleness, kindness, and as we'll see next week, self-control. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen.